everyone. I hope you all are having a wonderful spoopy season. Today, I want to take you all down a research rabbit hole that I've recently been on about a festive piece of spoopy millinery, the black witch hat. In the United States, the tall, conical, flat-brimmed witch's hat is a staple in our Halloween decorations, as well as any imagery or products relating to anything witchy, spooky, or frankly, just a little bit gothy. However, I think most of us watching this video can agree that over the course of 2020, there has been an explosion of witchy aesthetic clothing and accessories, especially with the witch's hat. Whether you're young or old, the amount of people embracing their inner witch and rocking the witch hat thrills me to no end. Because while researching this video, I also, as a result, researched the history of witches and it has left me with some very big fifis. And while I think there is something to be said for female identifying and non-binary folk embracing their inner witch in 2020, that's not what this video is about. Though I low-key would love Rowan Ellis to do a video on the rise of witches and witch core and witch talk like she did with cottage core, because I think she would be amazing at it. But that's also just like my total academic girl crush talking, so there we are. Today, it's all about the actual history of the witch hat. And no, I don't mean some crappy clickbaity nonsense. I mean actual, real, scholarly research on the subject. Let me tell you all, wow, did I fall down a massive rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> I've only been working on this for like five days straight, nonstop, or 12 hour days. If you have ever wanted to learn about 18th century dressmaking from the absolute best teacher ever, then I have got some great news for you. Burnley and Trowbridge is launching an online 18th century mantua making course taught by the incredible Brooke Wellborn. And enrollment opens up October 19th, which is tomorrow, by the way. I cannot stress this enough. Brooke was the person who taught me about 18th century dressmaking, and I do not think that there's a better teacher out there on the subject. Brooke cuts the most flattering, best ever, just incredible gowns, and I adore her work so, so much. While B&T has offered workshops for years, I even actually have taught a few back in the day. They've always been limiting because they were in person with very small class sizes. But now that they moved the workshop online, it's much more accessible and also much more affordable. So if you want to learn the basics of being an 18th century dressmaker, there's a link in the description that will take you to B&T's website. The course takes place over three weeks and features weekly live one hour Q and A's with Brooke. By the end of the course, she will have walked you through how to cut, fit, and stitch together a beautiful 18th century fitted back gown. I also want to stress that this video is not sponsored by Burnley and Trowbridge. When I heard the plans for the workshop, I just really got excited and I felt the need to kind of scream it from the rooftops because I'm just so thrilled by the idea. Now that I've shared my happy news, let's get witchy. The first time a woman was called a witch while wearing a tall, conical, flat-brimmed black hat in popular culture was in the early 1700s England. And while we are going to uncover all the wild history of this hat, I do want to take a moment to stress that this hat is not the same hat worn by sorcerers, magicians, and wizards. They are actually two different hats. This gender distinction is important for two very big reasons. The first being that when researching the history of witches, one is researching the history of sex and gender. You cannot discuss witches without discussing gender, gender norms, or the gender binary. Misogyny and sexism are fundamental in the creation of the myth of witches, and it is because of the prevailing misogyny and sexism within Western culture that witches and feminism are so intertwined. The second reason is due to the connection of the sorcerer's hat to medieval anti-Semitism, which will be discussed more in depth a bit later in this video. And now I think it's a good time to add a bit of a trigger warning here. I will be addressing issues like sexuality, gender, sexism, ageism, anti-Semitism, as well as anti-Quakerism. And while I will endeavor to do my best to address these delicate topics with great care, I do want to give you all a warning. The discussion of witches is a discussion of sex, sexuality, and gender. I would be doing myself and you all a disservice to not take a minute to address how gender is going to be addressed in this video. The witches we are discussing in this video are people who were identified as female within the gender binary from the 1450s to the 1800s. The term witch in and of itself is actually a heavily gendered term to describe a female practitioner of magic. Men who practiced magic were historically referred to as sorcerers and magicians. This gendering of practitioners of magic also played into how magic was and was not accepted in medieval Europe as sorcerers and magicians could and did hold respected positions within 
society, including acting as advisors to rulers and monarchs. Gender nonconformity and the rejection of patriarchal gender norms is a historic indicator of a witch. Since a woman who eschewed traditional and acceptable gender norms during her time, like working in trade, being single, and or overtly sexual in her behavior were all indications of medieval and early modern witchcraft, as I stated in my menstruation video, sex and gender is a spectrum. And on my channel, I want to create a safe and inclusive space. With that being said, when I speak about witches pre-2000, I will be using heavily gendered language in keeping with the research and the cultural beliefs at the time. When I speak about modern witches, I will be endeavoring to use inclusive language. Additionally, I believe that the idea of a witch and calling oneself a witch is now considered more gender neutral. Finally, when I am discussing witches in this video, I am not speaking of individuals who identify with the religion of Wicca. While I assume some of my viewers here are Wiccan and that there are many Wiccan who rocks a witch's hat, the conical black witch's hat predates re the religion of Wicca by over 200 years. While the iconography of the black witch hat does not come into the public consciousness until the early to mid 1700s, witches were a dominating force in European culture and mythology since the mid 1400s. To understand the history of the black witch hat, we first must establish what a witch was and what she looked like in Europe pre 1700. The church and the monarchs of the early medieval period, pre 1100, were not interested in witches and actively tried to downplay, ignore, and speak out against the possibility of their existence. However, by the 13th century, they had completely completely changed their tune and were all about hunting and eradicating witches. My personal theory as to why this happened is because the church was relatively new in its control of medieval Europe and it wanted to ignore any potential connections to traditional Celtic, Norse, and other pagan beliefs. However, when that didn't seem to work, they just fully embraced that fear-mongering as an effective tool to maintain power and control over Europe. Yeah! That's not awkward at all. The first books on witchcraft, which established many of the stereotypes we associate with witches today, were published during the last half of the 1400s with the book Malus Maleficarum, or The Witch's Hammer, or The Hammer of Witches, depending on the translation, being held up as the witch hunter's bibles for centuries to come. In fact, the book was so popular that 20 editions of the book were published between 1487 and 1520, and another 16 between 1574 and 1669. The book's popularity and continued continuous printing ensured that it was able to reach and influence much, if not all, of Europe. It was also translated into different languages and is still actually in print today. In The Witch's Hammer, which was a work sanctioned by the Pope, the two male authors, Henrik Incitor and James Sprager, established the rules on how to know when a woman was a witch. These rules quickly became accepted truths by society and were mirrored in popular art of the time. A great example of this is a print from circa 1500 by Albrecht Dürer that is commonly called a witch riding a goat back Backwards. Here he perfectly illustrates what a witch looks like in medieval Germany, which by the way was apparently the epicenter of the quote unquote witch epidemic, during the late medieval period. The witch is female, according to Incitoris and Spragers, witches were female. Old, because old women's spirits were inflamed with malice and rage. Gee, I wonder why. Shocker. Naked. This represented witches' overt sexuality and sexual appetite. One of the biggest fears around witches was their ability to render men impotent, cutting off men's genitals and keeping them in stored away in little baskets and bird's nests. Because beanie babies weren't a thing yet. Long wild hair. It was believed that witches' power could reside in her hair. Screaming, a woman's voice was believed to carry magical powers. The spindle she is showing is a sign of work, that she works as a weaver, and women who worked in trades like weaving, brewing, and midwifery were more likely to be accused of witchcraft than women who did not work. The threat to the patriarchal gender norms by an independent working female was just too much for these delicate men to bear. Side note, it is also during this time that men discovered how lucrative the weaving and brewing trades were, and they decided just to take over the industries, making it harder for unmarried women to find honest employment. This behavior was also mimicked in the late 18th century when men realized that the female-dominated millinery trade was full of financial opportunities, and they really wanted in on that piece. Next up is flying, to show her magical abilities by doing something unnatural. Riding the flying goat backwards, the idea of things being done backwards was associated with the devil. It is also a representation of the witch's rejection of societal and gender norms. The goat also is the devil himself, as it was said that the devil would turn himself into an animal and carry the witch through the sky. If she wasn't depicted riding an animal, it was usually a pitchfork. Or something else. A little... phallic -y. 
The witch is riding away from a hailstorm in the upper left hand corner there. Witches were accused of changing the weather as well as being the scapegoats for any natural disasters, droughts, etc. This version of the witch, established in 15th century Germany, set the standard for the witch for the next several hundred years in Europe. You see the same iconography being used to show witches throughout continental Europe art up through the 19th century. It seems that Britain followed fairly closely to the stereotype up until the 1700s, which is when we see the iconography of the witch in Britain completely change, resulting in the witch that Americans and Brits recognize today. The Anglo-American witch is an insular development within Great Britain, and eventually her colonies, and is not a reflection of the continental European ideas of what a witch looks like. Even today, witches in Europe look different than our pointy hat flying magic queen. In Sweden, witches come out around Easter to ask for candy, and they are just the cutest damn things with their cute little brightly colored headscarves and their little rosy cheekings, and then they have them little freckles, and they're just the cutest little do -do. Oh, they're so cute. Also, Swedish witches are definitely cottagecore witches, and I am here for that. Oh. Cottage core Swedish witches. Oh, I love it. Oh, so good. Okay, moving on. Now that we've established what defines a witch in medieval and early modern Europe, it's now time to discuss where the hat actually comes from. There are two popular theories and one old, less popular one, i.e., it's not on BuzzFeed or Vice yet and all of these theories I am going to address. While I think all theories presented are related to the broader discussion of the history of witches, only one of them actually makes sense when it comes to tracing the history of the black conical flat brimmed hat. The first theory, which has been shared quite a bit recently, is that the black conical hat comes from anti-Semitic sumptuary laws in medieval Germany. The connection between witches and anti-Semitism is a historical fact. As you can easily see the rise of anti-Semitism and witch mania happening at the same time in medieval German history. Jewish people and witches were often accused of the same quote unquote crimes and behaviors, including, but not limited to, heresy. The subject is well researched and well written about, and I have a couple of articles about it actually in my description below. However, I do not agree with the idea that the flat brimmed conical witch hat is a part of that particular side of witch history, and here's why. Naomi Lubrick wrote an incredible article called The Wandering Hat, Iterations of the Medieval Jewish Pointed Cap, where she traces the history of the pointed Jewish cap from ancient history up through the medieval period. In this article, she explains how the style of cap went from being a trend amongst the fashionable set in Europe, a point of satorial pride for Jewish men, to being used as a tool to other and shame Jewish men criminals, and Christian women who were convicted of having sex with Jewish men. In the article, Lubrick points out that Jewish men took particular pride in wearing their pointed caps and other hats in the early medieval Europe, citing a 12th century French rabbi who called the hats worn by the men in his congregation ostentatious. This hat was worn voluntarily by Jewish men up through the 13th century. By the end of the 1200s and early 1300s, the hat that was once a display of Jewish pride is now being used as a tool of othering and oppression due to a variety of reasons, including the onset of the Crusades. If I was to hazard a guess as to why this happened, I would wager that it had a lot to do with fear of anything and anyone who isn't a devout Christian male. However, throughout Lubrick's entire paper, she never once specifies that this pointed style cap was worn by Jewish women. In fact, the only reference she made to a woman wearing this cap was when a Christian woman was accused of having sex with a Jewish man and had to wear the hat as a punishment. Additionally, the style of hat itself varies throughout countries and regions, and Jewish men were required to wear different styles in those different regions. They were fined or jailed if they did not comply with the specific hat style. This variety of hats also makes it difficult to draw any sort of direct connection to the flat-brimmed tall conical witch's hat. This hat also was not standard throughout all of Europe. When the Fourth Lateran Council decreed in 1215 that Jewish people in all Christian countries be visibly distinguished from non-Jews, England decided that a badge was to be worn and not a hat. This legislative difference is crucial. The Black Witch's hat is an English invention and not a continental European one. European witches are not depicted wearing a pointed hat or cap in period art and imagery. However, sorcerers and magicians, both of which are understood to be males, 
are depicted wearing a tall, soft, pointed cap. Since England did not establish a hat as a marker of Judaism, it is fair to assume that English people would not have associated a tall, pointed hat to the Jewish faith like Germans or Italians would have. This sartorial difference is further emphasized by the passing of time. The iconography of the modern Anglo-American witch began in the 1700s, 500 years after those anti-Semitic laws were passed. To compare, we, right now, are closer to the foundation of the United States of America as a country than 1700s England was to the Fourth Lateran Council. With all that being said, Lubrick is able to easily trace the connections of the pointed cap to sorcerers and court jesters. This gender distinction is important. The hats worn by witches and sorcerers are not the same. They are a heavily gendered garment that were also created at different points in history. While there is plenty of evidence to connect anti-Semitism to the myths and stereotypes of medieval witches, described by Institoris and Sprager, I do not believe that the black conical hat associated with witches in Britain and the United States is one of them. However, with that being said, there is evidence to connect the soft pointed hat of the sorcerer and magician to this anti-Semitic practice pointed out by Lubrick. And while one might wish to argue that I'm splitting hairs with my conclusion, seeing as how male magicians and sorcerers were treated with a lot more respect and dignity in medieval Europe than their female counterparts, I would argue that this is a valid differentiation. The next theory, which is 100% crackpot, is that British alewives were the inspiration for the modern witch. The articles I found perpetuating this clickbaity nonsense cited no sources and were just crappy regurgitations of someone else's shoddy research. Yeah, that's right. I just threw down an academic speak. Within these make me want to bash my head into a wall type of articles, the main image used to back up their Natty Ice quality level claim is a print from a book from the late 1600s titled Remarkable Persons from the Reign of Edward III to the Revolution. Here we are introduced to Mother Louse, the owner of a notoriously filthy inn in Oxfordshire. Notably, she is also apparently the last woman in England to wear a ruff. Just FYI. While the image and depiction of Mother Louse are clearly satirical when taken within its historical context, shitty internet researchers and writers, desperate attempts to link her to witchcraft are a result of their gross misunderstanding of dress history during the 17th century. While I do not expect people to be experts in 17th century women's dress, when you play in the dress history sandbox, you should at least be able to have a basic understanding of the subject and time period. It's not that hard. According to the book, Mother Louse was an old woman by the late 17th century, and as such, she is dressed in the outdated fashions of her youth, thus indicated by her large ruff and arguably her wide-brimmed conical hat. The brewing of ale was a female-dominated trade pre-1460, when, like weaving, men decided to take it over because of the financial lucrative possibilities. Because the women who worked as alewives were able to earn an independent living, they, like weavers and midwives, were also more susceptible to accusations of witchcraft. However, the dress and style of Mother Louse is not indicative of an alewife, but is simply that of an older woman who is hilariously out of style. <laughs> At the very end of the 16th century, we see a fashion for tall, conical, flat-brimmed hats for women, such as this fabulous one worn by Esther Inglis. The trend for the tall, black, wool-felt hats lasted through most of the 1600s, with small adjustments in the shape and height of the crown. Women of all levels of society wore the style of hat as it was considered normal fashion for the time. It's not until the end of the 1600s that this style of hat becomes associated with Quaker women. Side note, I think we can all agree that Miss Salisbury over here is looking particularly fetching in her notably conical hat. Work! During the mid 17th century, the exact same moment in time when the tall, conical, flat-brimmed black hat for women had reached its peak of popularity, we see the founding of the Christian denomination known as the Religious Society of Friends, or what a lot of us today would know as Quaker, which by the way, if you're not already familiar with or aware of, it is still actually a thriving community today. As it turns out, Quakerism and people who identified as Quakers scared the ever-loving crap out of the rest of Britain. They were considered direct threats to long instituted status quos, societal and gender norms, and as a result were met with hostility and suspicion from other Brits. 
Hostility towards and suspicions of Quakers, especially Quaker women, resulted in physical aggressions, arrests, rumors, speculations, and a concerted effort by non-Quakers to destroy the religious movement. So much so that there is even legitimate speculation that one of the reasons behind the reinstating of the Stuart monarchy in England was to combat the quote-unquote threat of Quakerism and to go back to the good old days. In Barry Ray's article, Popular Hostility Towards Quakers in Mid-17th Century England, he outlines the various rumors and speculations associated with Quakers, and curiously, they mirror the same accusations and complaints the Western medieval world had about witches. Breaking of gender norms. Some of the earliest Quaker ministers were women, putting them in a position of power and holy authority, which directly conflicts with the Church of England. Women were not allowed to be ordained in the Church of England until the 1990s. Additionally, Quaker women were notoriously independent and very vocal within their church and communities. A well-known Quaker woman, Anne Blakeling, was described by a non-Quaker female contemporary as no woman but a man. I mean, can we get more anti-gender norms than that? Breaking away from traditional social hierarchies, Quakers didn't believe in paying tithes, which directly threatened the long-established income streams for the church. Additionally, Charles II stated that Quakers were quote-unquote inconsistent with any kind of government, meaning that Quakers Quakers were viewed as a direct threat to the monarchy. This tension between Quakers and the monarchy is mirrored in the perceived threat of witches, which were also viewed as a threat to monarchies as well as the church. To threaten the church or the monarchy is to threaten the patriarchy, which was considered a part of being a witch. Heresy. Their religious beliefs established them as heretics in 17th century England. Quakers minimized the importance of a historic Christ and emphasized the personal spirit above scripture. They also reject the traditional orthodox ideas of heaven and hell. How deliciously radical is that? Sexuality. Quakers were accused of being incredibly sexually promiscuous and, to be frank, perverted sex fiends. The Ballad of the Four-Legged Quaker and the accompanying illustration are about how a Quaker man has sex with a horse to create a half-horse and half-man, and I can't believe I'm sharing this with you guys. That final figure, though, and on the right, is a devil wearing a Quaker man's hat, clearly associating them with Satan's sin. Quaker women in the early 1700s were accused and often portrayed in pop culture as prostitutes and adulteresses. It is generally accepted from the mid-1600s to the early 1700s that Quakers were really, really into some good-ass sexy time. They were also just accused of being witches, just in general. Founder George Fox was suspected of being a sorcerer, turning people into Quakers by touching their foreheads and using magic. Quaker women were also regularly accused of witchcraft throughout the mid-1660s. And just like witches, Quakers were accused of causing bad weather. Additionally, in the beginning, they held their meetings in secluded outdoor locations, as well as in houses which directly mirrors how witches' sabbaths are portrayed in European art. Their trembling and shaking during these meetings mimicked the fits of those who were attacked by witches or were associated with the devil himself. Finally, their use of language, dress, and general social behaviors casted Quakers as outsiders amongst the British populace. Looking at this mountain of evidence, it is easy to see how the British public began to take the idea of the witch and the Quaker woman and began to kind of smash them into one. It is now time to illustrate how the vilified Quaker woman morphed into our modern idea of the witch. We've established that Quaker women received the brunt of the anger and hostility in late 17th century and early 18th century England. The hate directed towards Quaker women was so common that we see a boom of satirical prints mocking Quaker women. And in these images, the Quaker women are always dressed the same. Black dress, white neck handkerchief, apron, and a tall, flat-brimmed, black conical hat. For example, in this circa 1660s print, a female Quaker is speaking to what we can assume is the public, because we as the viewer of this print are the public, about the strength of her quote-unquote light to prevail against Satan. Behind her is Satan, also speaking in rhyme with his hand on her shoulder, indicating a certain level of intimacy. Below is the warning for the public, arguably a warning for women. With a face of brass, this woman that you see most impudently doth affirm that she the mind of God in all points more doth know than from the sacred scriptures air could flow. Presumptuous wretch, it were more fit that she at home should keep and mind her house whiffery. And if no means to live on work for bread, then idly gossip with her innigate head. 
Their light within doth so prevail, it makes them hot about the lail. Except a friend that point doth clear, they could themselves in pieces tear. Outside the obvious direct visual connections to female Quakers and their relationship to the devil, the inscription below is deeply rooted in the strict misogynistic gender norms of the mid to late 17th century. That this woman has no business being out and about in public, being loud with independent thoughts and feelings. No, for her own safety and yours, she needs to go back home and go back to her house swiffery, or at least conduct some sort of honest work instead of spreading quote unquote idle gossip. Again, let me remind you that the power of the female voice is directly related to medieval and early modern beliefs on witchcraft. I would argue that if you were to view this print through the lens of the 17th century British culture, which has had several hundred years of church-sanctioned, monarch-approved stereotypes about witches, it would be only natural to view this Quaker woman wearing her tall, conical, flat-brimmed black hat similar to that of a witch. By the end of the 17th century, we are witnessing a shift in popular fashion for women, no longer wearing feminized versions of doublets made by tailors, no. Fashionable English women are wearing mantuas and fontages. In this 1698 print of a London Quaker meeting, we can see the non-Quaker men and women in the lower left corner, witnessing a Quaker woman preaching. One woman has her back to us, but the other is in profile with her hand over her chest and her mouth open in what can be interpreted as a universal gesture of shock and awe. Obviously the shock is supposed to be coming from witnessing the Quaker woman breaking gender roles. While the group in the lower left corner helped tell the story of the print, the main character is the Quaker woman who takes center stage in this image. She is instantly recognizable for what she is, a scary, independent, gender non-conforming woman in a tall, black, conical, flat-brimmed hat. Furthermore, we can see that none of the Quakers, male or female, match their contemporaries in fashion. They are all instead dressed in dark and old fashioned clothes, though you will notice that there is no ruff to be found a la Mother Louse. The Quaker women in this image are basically 50 years out of date with their clothing. They are instantly recognizable to the general public as Quaker women in this style of dress. The idea of Quaker dress is so universally acknowledged at this point in history that we see references to it in plays featuring Quaker women. Actors and actresses had to provide their own costumes for plays, and so an actress working in the early 18th century would have known what Quaker dress is and had it made up, hat included. To further emphasize how rooted the imagery of a Quaker woman was to popular consciousness, let's take a look at Hogarth's A Harlot Progress, Plate 3. In this image, we see our main character, a prostitute, finally waking up for breakfast at quarter past 12. On the wall next to her bed, on the left side of the image is a black, flat-brimmed, pointed hat next to some birch sticks. Barry Wind argues in his article, Hogarth's Fruitful Invention, Observations on Harlot's Progress, Plate 3, that the hat on the wall is supposed to represent a Quaker woman's hat, which is to be interpreted as a symbol of sexual promiscuity and the harlot's extreme sexual appetite. On the other hand, one could argue that in this case, the hat is also a witch's hat, because by this time, we have at least one 18th century publication depicting a witch wearing a tall, conical, flat-brimmed black hat. The book, The History of Witches and Wizards, giving a true account of all their trials in England, Scotland, Sweden land, France and New England with their confessions and condemnation was published in 1720. And in it we see what I have been able to identify so far as the first image that directly identifies a woman wearing a black conical hat as a witch. The first story in the book is about the trial of convicted wizard Julian Cox. On page six, we see a woodblock print of a witch, devil, and sorcerer flying on brooms, harassing a victim. The witch is clearly shown wearing a flat-brimmed, tall, comical hat. And while the story takes place in the 1660s, we must remember that in the 1720s, when this book was published, British society was still deeply anti-Quaker, and contemporary prints about Quakers would depict Quaker women in the same exact fashion, including, but not limited to, the frontispiece of the Quaker's art of courtship from 1710, showing several Quaker women in the tall conical hats. Between Ray's long list of witchy things that Quakers were accused of, as well as Quaker women bearing the brunt of anti-Quakerism, it is entirely logical that early 18th century readers of the book would associate the witch with a Quakeress. Obviously, this terrible publicity for the Quaker faith was becoming increasingly problematic, and the narrative around Quakers needed to change. While I haven't been able to narrow it down to an exact date or the exact cause of this sartorial upgrade, though it seems highly likely witches had 
something to do with it. There was definitely a massive shift in public perception of Quaker women by the 1750s. So somewhere between the 1720s and the 1750s, we see a change in imagery surrounding the Quaker woman. A new ideal of the Quaker woman is presented and is one that most historians would recognize today. This print of the quote unquote new Quaker woman is the perfect example. In the 1750s print entitled The Fair Quaker, we see an entirely new version of the late Quaker lady. She is beautiful, she is demure in her posture and her mouth is closed. Very different from the early images of Quaker women wailing and flailing. She is dressed in clothing that was fashionable for the 1750s, and the only thing that really distinguishes her as a Quaker is a small black hood worn over her cap. The inscription describes her as, nor gold nor gems are wanting to the maid, in neat simplicity like this arrayed. Plain maid of beauty more delights the heart than all the glittering ornaments of art. Hmm. Before moving on, let's just all take a collective second to give the PR team that handled this public perception of Quakers a massive round of applause for handling this public relations and marketing nightmare. Well done. Well done. It is also by the 1750s that we see the modern image of the witch solidify itself within British popular culture. Throughout the rest of the 18th century, prints and images depicting witches flying on brooms explode in popularity. Coincidentally, the shift in perception of the witch as an actual threat to public safety, to a cute fairy story, and a source of comedy correlates beautifully with the broader cultural shifts of 18th century Great Britain that result in the era that we now refer to as the Enlightenment, which gave more emphasis on scientific thought, less emphasis on the church, more equality among the sexes, an increase of rights, and eventually a lot of democracy by way of revolutions. If I'm being perfectly honest, I usually like to describe the last quarter of the 18th century as a time of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. By the mid-19th century, the image of the English witch was used for representations both good and bad magic, as illustrated in this title page of a book of fairy tales from 1849. In it, we see that in the lower right-hand corner two quote-unquote witches, the first being Cinderella's fairy godmother, a universally acknowledged bringer of good and wonderful things, and Mother Goose, who is the sweet older lady that these stories come from. From there on, the idea of witches and Halloween continued to grow in popular culture and popularity, from antique holiday postcards depicting witches wearing their hats and flying on brooms, the Wizard of Oz and Wicked, to where we are today, with the rise of witch core, witch talk, and the witch hat becoming an icon of feminism, embracing one's own magical feminine energy, independence, and a rejection of the patriarchy and gender norms. While I think it might be easy to be wary of the hat for fear of it being anti-Quaker, I would offer a different interpretation. Female Quakers of the 17th century were, clearly, brave and empowered women who were not afraid to stand up for what they believed in. They spoke their minds, fought against oppressive gender norms, and were early fighters for female equality, even if they weren't doing so consciously. The hat that Quaker women wore, once just an everyday hat that became associated with Quakers and witches, is representative of power, both their inner power as well as their power over British society. To wear a witch hat today is in part a celebration of the brave Quaker women who helped fight for gender equality, as well as an acknowledgement of the countless number of women accused of witchcraft who were murdered, arrested, and ostracized from their communities just for being different. By wearing a witch hat, you demonstrate that you are someone who identifies with what it means to be a witch. This can mean many different things from being a practitioner of magic, Wiccan, pagan, or even anti-religion, to someone who believes in gender equality, freedom of sexual expression, independence and embracing one's inner self. And with that, my beautiful friends, I believe it is time to conclude this dress history lecture. I hope that you all enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed researching it and making it. I want to give a quick thank you to Kenna Liebes, Bernadette Banner, and Andrew Apple for being my proofreaders and argument nitpickers. I so appreciated your all's help on this video so, so much. If you all like this kind of content, please feel free to subscribe because I love actually making these kinds of videos and I'm already planning uh, quite a few more. And with that, I hope that you all have a wonderful rest of your week and I will see you all back here next Sunday with a new video and I hope you all have a good one. Wait, I think I'm missing something. Now it's time to go. Is a staple in our <laughs> do, 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 do. pause. Back up, back up, back up real slow. Space. Blue. Or wait.
The riches. <laughs> Naomi, Lu Naomi Luber. Couple little bit. Hmm. I'm gonna work your mouth around that name there, Cax. Well, you didn't kill it, so I had to. Good. Oh, good oh, boy. Good drop. Did he pee? Dude. Wow. No, no, sir. Two eggs. Next to speed. I cannot say that word because I have dropped out for an Indiana. <laughs> well, what the hell was that, Cox? Jesus. 